to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God for His Word. We just thank Him for this great nation that gives us the right and the privilege to gather together. How precious she is. And we just praise God for her and the many blessings for indeed He does bless America. So we thank Him for His Word and we ask that He be with us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, on completion of the book of Ecclesiastes, rather than starting another book, I thought we would do a little exercise this evening. Well, call it whatever you like. Not a test, but an example of how you put knowledge and wisdom gain from that book of wisdom to work in God's Word. Let's take one specific subject, if we may. That was covered a great deal, and as much as Ecclesiastes was written to the flesh man and how your soul, the inner man, should control and make that flesh body work for you. Then we found that the flesh goes into the ground. And there it is evermore. Dust to dust, ashes to ashes. But the spirit, which is the intellect of the soul, returns instantly to the Father that gave it. Meaning that we have a God of the living, not a God of the dead. Now, to apply that then, I want to go through some New Testament scriptures to show you how that the knowledge of God's written word, which is to say the Old Testament, can make the New Testament spring to life for you. You can have a better understanding. As an example, again, we're focusing from Ecclesiastes on um, call it life after death of the flesh, not life after death, for no one dies. They go instantly to the Father from whence they came. We covered that in the 12th chapter. But to understand that, then they take on that angelic body, which is to say simply your spiritual body, as it is taught in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So, I want you to turn with me, if you would, in the book of Matthew. You're not going to have these on your screen, but it'll be good for you to get a little exercise in the Word of God. Matthew chapter 22. You'll remember we covered Matthew not long ago, but I want you to note how, how this study in Ecclesiastes um, um, helps your understanding in all of God's teachings. It is precious the way the scriptures fit neatly together. No man can cross them and let God's overall purpose and plan flow. You'll remember, I'll set the stage to you for you here in chapter 22 of the book of Matthew. The Sadducees were trying to trip Christ up for the Sadducees did not believe in life after death of the flesh. All right? So they were trying to trip him up. He said, hey, there was a lady that was married to seven brothers. They all died. Now which will she be married to in the eternity or when you are raised? All right. Jesus then in the 29th verse of this 22nd chapter answers. Now I want you to see how the book of Ecclesiastes helps you to understand the scripture, the teachings of Jesus. 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. In other words, because they did not know the book of Ecclesiastes. That's the scripture he's speaking of. You err. That's why Jesus, when asked a question, he said, Haven't you ever read it? It's written. That's why I'm taking advantage of our knowledge just gained from the book of Ecclesiastes to show how it, uh, how it complements the New Testament or any teaching as far as that's concerned. Jesus first telling them, if you knew the scriptures, you would not ask that. Listen closely. 30, for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. In other words, they are in that spiritual body. Which is what? That's the body that the angels are in. How perfect the plan of God. 
your knowledge from the book of Ecclesiastes helps you a great deal there because you knew and understood the flesh that we read of in the last lecture, how that it grows old, it loses its passions, it loses its teeth, its hair falls out, our bones get frail and fragile, we become afraid of heights, we grow hard of hearing, and our sight grows dim in old age. Letting you know you're not losing a whole lot when you put that aside and step into that beautiful uh, spiritual body that knows no pain. The word in the Greek is uh, incorruptible. It means incapable of, of uh, disease, sickness, aging, etc. What a body to be in. That's the one that Christ prepared for you. Your mansion, your habitation for the eternity if uh, your soul is transferred into that new body in an eternal sense, which is to say this mortal being must put on immortality, soul-wise, uh, not only body-wise. So then we begin to see in this, listen to Jesus now, verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, as touching where those dead are and when they are raised, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, in other words, this is the scripture, haven't you read it? Verse 32, I am, there's the sacred name, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I am not the God of those ashes or that dust that that flesh body turned back into. I'm the creator of the erats, the terra firma, the soil, the clay. He was the creator of that, but he's the father of the soul. A much more personal, a much more touching, loving, approach with to your relationship with Almighty God. You see, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were with him. They were not dead. They were not in the ground. They were living. And so we see then, we can better understand what Jesus was talking about. We do not marry nor give in marriage in that body. Why? There will be no children born. No children born whatsoever. Why then were children to be born in this earth age? That was God's way of allowing each soul to enter. Therefore he created woman and the womb whereby those children could enter into this earth age. You know, Paul taught a great deal as well concerning where the dead are with the thought and in mind from Ecclesiastes, so fresh. I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to understand a, an in-depth teaching that is so often misquoted and used uh, for the resurrection, the rapture, the lifting out, or whatever, because of the ignorance of men. They are ignorant of the truth. Some of them would even tell you that your relatives are out here under the sod. What kind of God would we have if our relatives were out here under the sod? Does he have the ability to give life or not? Of course, he's the God of living. He is not the God of the dead. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let's pick it up in verse 13. And I want you to see specifically what Paul is is talking about what he is addressing and I want you to see what man has turned it into I think the knowledge just gained from Ecclesiastes will give you a new light many of you chapter thir chapter 4 of 1st Thessalonians verse 13 and it reads but I would not have you to be ignorant brethren Do you understand what that means I don't want you to be ignorant concerning them that are asleep. I don't want you to be ignorant about the dead. 
that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. In other words, you got a bunch of heathen out there that don't know we serve a living God running around worshiping idols and they weep uh, for the dead. Oh, it's all right to weep for sorrow of losing a loved one. But at the same time, find a little spot in your heart to rejoice because they've gathered back to God, as you learned in Ecclesiastes. Now, Greek is very specific. What is Paul addressing here? Where those are that sleep. And concerning the resurrection. He doesn't want you to be ignorant about it. What is he going to draw from? The Old Testament. It is written. He wants you to draw from it. Verse 14. Let's see if it falls in place better for you now than perhaps ever before. 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Now hold it right there. Do you or don't you? Well, every Christian believes that. Then I don't really see any big hang-up. If they, if they believe that, then what? Even so, them also. Now, now stop there a moment. Them also. Not just Christ alone rose from the dead. Them also. Which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him? How can he bring them with him if they're out here under the clods, in the mire? He can't. Therefore, as it is written, they go instantly, the soul, to him, and the dust returns back to dust for an eternity, forever. What he's telling you there, my dear one, is that if you believe Jesus rose out of that tomb, you better believe that everybody that dies does. Or you're really not a believer. You're not a Christian. If you don't believe that your relatives in Christ and are otherwise, they all do. Sinners and saints. They all raise there for judgment when that judgment time comes. For God is not the God uh, of the dead, but the living. Do you think for a moment that Almighty God, with the love in his heart, would allow a scoundrel like Satan to run in heaven? To be in heaven? It's documented, Revelation chapter 12, that he is there, along with the book of Job chapters 1 and 2. Do you think God would allow Satan to be in heaven and be so hard on your innocent ancestors and those passed on that he would leave them out here under the rocks, the clods, in some miserable box? Box is for the flesh. God is for the living. What Paul has said, very simply, he's not talking about a rapture. He's talking about where the dead are, and he doesn't want you to be ignorant about it. They're with God. If you believe Jesus is there, and as it is recorded, he's at the right hand of God, then you better believe the others are there. Because that's what he paid the price for. Otherwise, you teach and practice a dead religion. That's Satanism. You either believe God's word or you don't. Now, I want to, again, I want you to see how rewarding the book of Ecclesiastes is in understanding what Paul is saying here. He will bring them with him. As it is written in Revelation chapter 6, John was taken in the year uh, 60 A.D., let's say, give or take a few years. And he was showing all those that were under the altar even to the Lord's day before the seventh trump. They were already there. They had washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and were singing praises. They, they were You couldn't count them. They were there. Those that had shed their blood, even if you would, for the name of Jesus, uh, the mortars, talking, being understood. They were present. My dear friend, believe me, you serve a living God and a God of the living, not a God of the dead. 
Never listen to anyone that will try to teach a ministry of death, for it is bondage, death being that bondage. Verse 15. For this we say unto you, by the word of the, by the word of the Lord, comma, hold it right there. What word? Right in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, we that are in this, remember the live dogs better than a dead lion? We that walk under this sun? We that are in the flesh and the flesh lives? And remain, that means on earth, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. There's no way that any of we that are living can prevent. The word in the Greek is proceed. We can in no way proceed those that are already dead. Why? If you listen to the word of God, you know why that we that are living and remain into the coming of the Lord cannot precede the dead because they're already there. It's that simple. They're already there. How precious it is that Paul says, as taught by the word of the Lord. That's why it's so important that we study his word, beloved, so that we grow. And we take the wisdom of Solomon and others, all wisdom coming from God, and grow into his truth and the simplicity rather than listening to the nonsense that some men pound and teach from pulpits. You see, they don't know what they're talking about when they counter the word of God. And it's quite easy for you to understand when they know what they're talking about and when they don't. If they don't, get rid of them. And whatever you do, don't support them. For you're supporting a work of Satan and ignorance. Verse 16. Uh, what I'm saying is don't expect, you, you can support them if you want to, but don't expect God to bless you for helping Satan's work. Satan will bless you for it, but God won't. All right? Is that quite clear? Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, that is the last trump, the seventh trump, which sounds when the two witnesses rise from the street, the seventh trump and last trump not sounded, which is God's trump as it's well illustrated in the book of Revelation. Until those two witnesses rise from the street and fear comes over those that worshiped Antichrist thinking he was Christ come to rapture them away. At this trump, the trump of God, colon, I want you to note, colon, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What is the subject? The dead do rise first. Why? They're already risen. If you believe Christ rose, you must believe they rose also. They are with him. The Greek is very specific in it, though the translation has enough uh, uh, thought that the weak fall by the wayside. But wisdom from the Lord's word allows your mind to keep the thought in context and the truth flows smoothly for the God, our Father does not say one thing out of one side of his mouth and something else out of the other. For example, the Old or the New Testament. They must align. They must complement each other or you're not understanding the Word of God. Verse 17. As you probably recognize, this is where most people get the rapture theory, but that's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about where the dead are, not some flyaway goony bird story. 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them 
in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this word air in the Greek, er, is not the word sky. Do you know what it is? It's breath of life. We'll meet them in that new spiritual body. The body that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that we will all instantly be changed into. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Paul spoke colloquial Greek. He was educated in Hebrew under Gamaliel at his feet, the greatest of Hebrew scholars. He spoke colloquial Greek, which is to say, as much as he moved around, he picked up many words. In other words, understand what I'm saying. He was not educated in the Greek language. He only spoke that that he heard. He was educated in Hebrew. Therefore, he uses figures of speech, idioms, and so forth. I want you to just hold your place there and turn with me over into the book of Hebrews. To show you some of Paul's style, you can't miss it if you understand the manuscripts. His thumbprints are on it. Because whichever area he moves to, he picks up their speech. As in Arkansas, here you might walk on the street and down the street here and you would hear someone say, Yunz has come over and see us this weekend. Whereas if you were up north, well, I don't know what they say up north, but uh, they probably say, you all come. Or, no, I'm sure they don't do that. Probably they say come over or something to that effect. Do you understand what I'm saying? Different areas have different ways of saying things. Together in a cloud, it's, you say, look at that cloud of locust. It's a figure of speech. To Paul, it meant together in a crowd. Chapter 12, the book of Hebrews, verse 1, Paul the writer. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... A cloud of what? A cloud of witnesses. That means a large group. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before of us. For us, let us gather in a cloud and run this foot race. We have work to do on this earth in the millennium. Christ is coming here. Nobody's flying off anywhere. But Christ's own will gather in a large assembly, a cloud, if you wish, around him, with him, and we shall be in that spiritual body. Those of you with strong concordances to take the sledgehammer and knock in the head the rapture theory for the final time in your mind, I want you to quite simply look up that word air in your strong concordance and it will say breath of life. Then I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to look up the word sky in your Strong's Concordance. You understand? Sky. And you'll find it's a totally different word. and has nothing to do with the breath of life. What Paul is saying is he is reiterating his teachings of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that we will all that not sleep instantly at a twinkle of an eye change into this beautiful body of the breath of life, that spiritual body, and be with the Lord forever if you overcome. Verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Comfort them how? Comfort those that lose a loved one. That's what he's talking about, not some goony bird fly away feather duster story. But comfort your neighbor when they lose a loved one. Rather than some goony bird preacher running over and saying, Don't worry, honey, they'll be safe there under the ground. They're dead. Your pastor has consoled you. We don't know whether they've gone to heaven or hell. They're dead. God is the God of dead. That'd really lift you up, wouldn't it? Hmm? And really make your day. No. God is the God of living. No, don't you be ignorant of where the dead are, whereby you can comfort one another with these words. Words that address where they are. And yes, bless your hearts, when we shall join them. 
You see the word resurrection, you might as well look it up in your Strong's while you're at it too in the Greek and find out that it has three meanings whereby you can educate yourself a little better into receiving God's word. It is written and so it shall stand. You know, what do you do and what must you do? Well, did Paul know what he was talking about? Well, a lot of Goonie birds misunderstood his first letter, so he wrote a second one. He rushed it because pa uh, Silas and Timothy were still there. They weren't there very long, so he hastened this second letter to them. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 while we're there. He's talking to the same group of people that he that you if some would interpret Goonie bird fly away to. He's telling that same identical group of people they misunderstood him. And this is how they're going to meet the Lord. Do you understand? Can you follow that? He is talking to the same people, only they messed their own minds up. Listen closely. Chapter 2, verse 2. I'm sorry, chapter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. I want to talk to this group about Christ returning here and our gathering back to him. Is that difficult? He doesn't want you to be ignorant about this either. He's talking to you about our gathering back to Christ, period. All right? He said, I, I, I want you to know that's what we're going to talk about. Verse 2, that you be not soon shaken in mind. Don't let somebody get the egg beater in your skull and mix your mind up with this death stuff, all right? Or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word. Don't you let some preacher teaching the word of God twist it. Nor by letter as from us. Don't you let that first letter to you Thessalonians where I was talking about gathering in a cloud confuse you. As that the day of Christ is at hand, that you're going to rapture away. Understand, he's writing the same letter, or rather he's writing a second letter to the same people he wrote the first letter to. Well, I heard there were two Greek. Now, there's just one group. God only has one set of children. Many tribes, many races, but one set of children. Verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away. That's apostasy. Many people deceived. Many people confused. And that man of sin be revealed. That's Apalia, which is to one of Satan's name. It is Satan, the son of perdition, Apalia. Don't, hey, don't let some preacher deceive you, friend. Christ is not going to gather back to us until after the son of perdition does what? Appears here and deceives the world. Four, who opposeth and exalteth, exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. In other words, playing Savior. Don't worry, nobody's going to make any flyaway trips before this happens. Paul's writing to the same people. You know, people get hooked up on the fairy tale that started 150 years ago, and they can't come off of it. They've got to have some man-made tradition that is their security blanket. And they title and cuddle them little selves up in it, and they're going to worship Antichrist. It's like an idol worship. Does that sound hard, friend? It's serious, worshiping devil. Worshiping Satan as Antichrist is very serious. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. I told you all about it. I went into detail. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Who? You can't stick something into the Greek. A lot of ill-advised non-scholars would tell you this is the church. They are not scholars. They know not what they speak of. The verb is transitive. Greek is specific. It's talking about that same Antichrist and Michael that prevents him. Michael prevents him from what? Remaining in heaven for one thing, but also having free run of this earth. 
He's in prison assigned to Michael in heaven. But when Michael's ready, and you can read that account in Revelation chapter 12, out he comes to this earth. For the mystery of inequity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That is Michael, and then Satan's going to be booted out, and then shall that wicked be revealed. He'll be here, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. All right, you got it? The Lord, when? When and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Lord comes after him. <clears throat> now, you might say, well, why make such a big thing out of this? Well, it's it, it. worship Satan if you want to. If you believe the rapture theory, you shall absolutely, I can guarantee you, 100%, if you don't change your mind, you will worship Satan. Antichrist, which is to say instead of Christ. It's not some human being that some spirit moves into and a man shows his ignorance when he teaches such trot. Satan himself is the son of perdition. God's word makes it very clear. How man likes to play church. God's word, I prefer it. It's strong, yes, but it's very specific. Well, now we were in the Old Testament. Now you've come to the New Testament. It doesn't talk anything about that back in the Old Testament. Oh, it doesn't? That's the point I'm trying to teach you. Turn with me real quickly in closing to Isaiah. The book of Isaiah, chapter 25. Turn there with me. God's Word will stand up. You don't have to worry about it. Never apologize for it. A man might have to apologize for his ignorance and what he teaches concerning rapture, but God's word doesn't teach it, nor will it ever have to apologize for it. This is the return of Almighty God to this earth as he establishes his kingdom in Isaiah chapter 25 in the Old Testament. And we pick it up in verse 7 of that 25th chapter for the sake of time. And he will destroy in his mountain, that's the nation, the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. That's the veil of the big lie. Remember we read of it in Ezekiel chapter 13 where the rapture theory threw the veil over the saving arms of God and they led people to hell by teaching them to fly, to fly away to save their souls. That's Satan talk. It's the teachings of the devil. He says, I'm going to rip that lie and deception away from them, as well as he will remove his own stupa, Romans chapter 11, that he placed upon them. Eight. He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall be taken away shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. He's going to return. He's going to take away that rebuke. Destroy death, how Christ did it. The Godhead paid the price on the cross. Death, where is your sting? Christ paid the price to raise the dead. They're with him. Don't teach they're in the ground. They're free. So stop teaching bondage. Verse 9. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. We didn't fall for funny bunny when he showed up on the scene. That's to say the son of perdition. You see, it's taught in the Old Testament. We waited for the true God. We didn't get in that veil of fuddy-duddy fly away, goony bird talk. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, not the Antichrist. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. You see, God wants you to wait for him. That's why Jesus in another figure of speech said, Woe to those that are with child when I return. Those that give suck. 
How can Jesus turn against the fa Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, if you want documentation? How could Christ teach against childbearing when we were instructed from the very garden, go forth and replenish the earth? It's honorable to bear children. And for them him finally to say, Woe to the woman that is with child when I return. You see, he was speaking in a spiritual sense, beloved. He is the husband, and you are to be a virgin when he returns. If a husband has been away for 2,000 years and returns, pregnancy is nine months in whichever dispensation it was. It's all the same for the human being. It would have meant that nine months prior or, or more recent, she had, she had um, taken on a false lover. He knows there will be a wedding before the true wedding. See that you are the part of the five that keep their wicks trimmed and wait for the Lord. As Paul taught in 2 Thessalonians, it, don't let any man deceive you. Christ will not return to this earth until after. Antichrist stands in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus, uh, claiming to be God. If you choose to listen to man rather than the word of God, then you choose your own lot and you shall wallow in it. We are in the last days. They are soon upon us. I wanted to discuss this because Ecclesiastes gives you the foundation in wisdom to know where the dead are. It brings those scriptures in the New Testament to life and it gives you the fulfillment to know God loves his children he doesn't have them in little vials of dust he has those beautiful bodies as Paul said also in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 I would not have you ignorant for that that dies uh, is not the same as comes up that beautiful body that goes back to the father well, I hope you've enjoyed this. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment. I want to share something with you.